The fourth objective is to implement current safety and social distancing precautions as recommended by public health and CDC to prevent the potential spread and exposure to our campus community and coordinate closely with custodial crew to ensure all access spaces are sanitized daily. And so we have a social distancing unit that's really working to make sure that anybody that comes to campus is following that criteria. We're, we're testing out certain things, even in public safety right now, we're testing out, uh, what do you call it, the plexiglass between officers just to see what materials and what has been put out there to see if it works and to practice it prior to everybody coming back to campus. And so that's the main thing that this group works on is how we're going to develop stickers on the ground to tell people where to stand and it has footprints and we wanted it to have Highline College colors. Uh, we might have to move some of our services to different buildings once we decide to open up services and make sure that we can maximize space and it might still be appointment only. It might still have them logging into a terminal and talking to somebody through the screen. We just haven't decided all that yet, but that's a lot of what this group does. We have somebody from the healthcare on it. We have some of our deans from student services. We have our HR director on there. So there's a lot of people involved to make sure, you know, the other thing is to make sure that this is something that works for all employees since we have employees from different unions. Um, the fifth one is to develop a phased approach to returning services employees to campus which directly addresses challenges and risks with several mitigation efforts. I know Francesca is going to talk a lot about that one, so I'm going to move on to six. And then we're going to begin, begin work with department offices to assess ways to implement best practices in infection prevention tactics and social distancing. And I know with the phased approach, one of the first phases we're talking about is just possibly having employees return to campus or maybe even having them work out within their division, you know, some on some days and some on the other days. And our different units will work with these offices to make sure that what we're doing meets the guidelines from the CDC and public health and not putting other employees at risk. So really it's gonna be a lot of work with the different units working with different departments to help return the campus to our new normal. Because that's one thing we say in the uh, emergency management field is we never return to normal, we, uh, we will return to a new normal. So at this point, uh, if there's not any questions for me, I'd like to turn it over to Francesca. Thanks, David. Um, you hit uh, a lot of what I was going to say <laughs> anyway. But, My apologies. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, so, so we are looking forward um, to reopening services, but it's not obviously going to be all at once. And we don't even know if it's going to be on May 5th. It kind of, like Dr. Mosby said, all depends on what the, um, governor does um, with his proclamation. Uh, but in the meantime, we are creating a very slow, very cautious, phased approach to returning services back to campus along with employees. I kind of think of it as um, returning back to normal life after a surgery. You're not gonna do a whole bunch right when you get home from the hospital. You're probably gonna sit on the couch for a while um, and just get used to being back home and then figure out what your movement and ability is little by little and that's that's how we look at this plan um, and there's a lot of guidance that we're going to follow from the cdc the public health department and osha as well um, but a lot of this is going to depend on a granular level of people also just committing to all of these protective measures that we want to put in so there's gonna be some self-monitoring that we'll probably put in place. And we're still thinking about having flexible work environments where people telecommute if you can't, you know, appropriately put social distancing into your office spaces. So there's there's a lot of ways that we can address the challenges that a, a virus creates in a workplace. Um, but just reiterating and emphasizing that it, it goes down to a very granular level of making sure employees don't put other employees at risk and we can maintain a healthy workforce. So while the college is going to have this overarching general plan, I think eventually all departments and offices will have to take a look at it within their own um, set up and see what works best for, for them as well. So I want everyone to start thinking about what that looks like um, and we'll provide a lot of helpful guidance along the way as well. But really um, 
just emphasizing that everyone start thinking about what it would look like to bring first your employees back slowly and then a lot of limited services and then what it would look like to bring all of your services back and what you think you might need for that as well. Other than that, I think that's all I have. Thank you, David and Francesca. Um, I don't see any questions right now, but I'd ask that you uh, stay on and uh, there might be some questions that come up uh, through the afternoon um, if you all could to answer and stuff to respond to. So thank you. Oh, we got two questions. I'm sorry. I'm new. This uh, Zoom life is very new to me. So I'm, I'm learning uh, lights and different things pop up. So there are two questions. Do you have them, Heather? Yes, I do. I see two. We have uh, two questions from Laura, and we just got another one from May Lukens as well. That just kind of. Can you see them? I do. Are they specifically about what David and Francesca were talking about? I think May's is. Okay. David, uh, can you see May's question? You're muted, David. Sorry. So May has asked, "What does that mean for allowing students on campus?" Really, at this point, it's hard to say without knowing what the state and what Governor Ensley is going to be putting out at his press conferences. But we're making plans is what we're doing right now. We, we know eventually sometime, at some point students are going to have to return to campus, uh, whether it's for limited services. And maybe those services are where buildings are still closed, but they come to campus for appointments. We just don't know what the guidelines from the state are going to be at this point. So we have to kind of plan for all possibilities and make those plans. That way, if they decide on Monday they want all campuses to be open and everybody to return, we're ready, even though we hope that's not the case because we would like to have a gradual phased return. We're going to plan for every single possibility that we can think of just to make sure we're, we're ready. I hope that answers your question, May. Thank you, David. And Laura, I see your questions and, and uh, I'll be able to speak to them um, after uh, Summer's presentation. Good segue, Summer, you ready? Yes, all right, here I go. Hi, everybody. Um, I wanted to start by just thanking all of the Highline staff and faculty for all of your hard work during these last few months. Um, it just, I'm just amazed by everybody's dedication to providing services to our students and our community in these difficult times. As I said in a message that went out to staff this morning, it's not just that we're continuing to do our normal work, but also doing it um, in these precarious situations at home while a lot of us are also caring for young children, family members, and just working within um, some really challenging environments. So I just want to thank everybody for your hard work. Um, as far as HR, I wanted to let everyone know that we are really prioritizing trying to bring you up to date information, whether that's about trainings or best practices, um, but also just about the changes to different federal and state policies that are available to employees. As you know, um, there has been a new federal act that has expanded um, paid medical leave for, for folks. So I hope everybody's been seeing those message from me, messages from me and taking advantage if you can. Um, and then finally, I wanted everyone to know that uh, in human resources, we are trying our best to conduct business as usual. So what I mean by that is that we continue to deliver all of our normal services to you, whether that's hiring or payroll or position reviews or union business. We are trying to balance um, everything that's going on with COVID-19 with just keeping up with the day-to-day -day work that you all expect from us. You should also know that position reviews are still being uh, conducted, so you don't have to uh, wait until we're back on campus if you feel that you're entitled to a position review. 
or if you want to, if you know of anybody or want to file um, any concerns about discrimination or sexual uh, harassment, that our Title IX office is still open and operating. So I think it's important for everybody to know that those services and um, protections that are in place for employees are still there and operating. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have, but first and foremost, just again, thank you so much. All right, for HR, um, uh, there's a question that says, I know we're trying to hire student workers in some places. I've heard that there's a freeze on this. Can we prioritize getting these students up and running? Um, I would need a little more information about this. There is, uh, we're, there is a hiring freeze. We are trying to prioritize hiring. I would encourage you, whoever sent this question, to please talk to your manager and your VP. All positions right now are going up through executive cabinet. So whether that's a student position or a full-time staff position or a faculty position, executive cabinet is gonna review those as a group. So please have that discussion with your manager and we will get that um, reviewed for you as quickly as possible. All right, thank you everyone. Okay, thank you, Summer. Appreciate that. Can might be some other questions that come up, so you can kind of stay back. That'll be great. Um, so I want to start by going over uh, some of the questions that were submitted in advance, and um, be able to answer that and call upon um, some other folks as well uh, to help uh, provide some information. Uh, one of the questions, and forgive me, as I I have it. Couple of, couple of stacks here, so I'm gonna be looking up and down. But uh, one of the questions was, is it true that Building 6 is gonna have a big restructure to make student intake and services easier to access, like in a welcome center format? If this is true, what is the, def excuse me, what is the timeline ETA of this restructure in student services? So my hope is, and my expectation is that we review um, and this is also a question I think that came up earlier in the uh, Q&A box, that we review our processes. I mean, this has been a very challenging time and it's required us to look at things differently and to do things differently. And this is an opportunity for us to be able to see what ways we can do, what ways we can uh, utilize in terms of utilizing, helping students out. So what can we do to eliminate some of those steps if needed? Um, not just in terms of serving our students, but also in terms of helping our staff and faculty in terms of serving our students. Um, that does not necessarily require a restructuring of a whole building by any means. Um, I think that, you know, for as restructuring is going right now, I know there was a lot in particular in student services over the past year. And I think at this point, we just need to look at our services see what we can do to revise them. Um, and in terms of restructuring, right now, because of COVID and because of some of our challenges, um, we really need to kind of hold off on major sweeping uh, structural changes. Um, and part of that is also be due to the state and how they can assist us. And right now, if they, if they can or not in terms of funding. But in terms of really trying to make the process easier for students and to serve them, uh, my expectation is departments throughout the campus and programs throughout the campus take a look at your processes, see what can be changed, what can be adjusted, what can be updated, um, and then document those processes so we can then inform our students and have a smooth process to, to address their needs. Another question has been, uh, obviously this has been a quarter of change. What are we doing to accommodate students who are struggling in this new environment? For example, allowed to change grades to pass fail, extend deadline for dropping, et cetera. It has been a quarter of change and we are talking with students, uh, checking in on them to see 
uh, how they are doing. Uh, I know there was a counsel, uh, email coming from Vince this today for counseling services, again, reminding folks of the various services counseling offers. Uh, our counseling department has, has really been exceptional, continues to be exceptional in stepping up to really address um, our student needs from a uh, virtual format, since that's really uh, the main way of communication at this point. Um, having Joshua uh, return and, and assist um, only adds to really the talent in the counseling department and the ability to offer uh, additional services um, and staff for, for students. Um, so in terms of changing grades to pass fail, exceeding deadlines for dropping, um, that is really a conversation with faculty. Um, in terms of their processes. And we're, again, hopefully that our staff and faculty are having conversations with students um, to check in on them, but also to see how to better assist them. Obviously for many of our students, uh, this shift to um, emergency remote teaching and service delivery is quite challenging. Our students, majority of them did not sign up for this because if they would have wanted to do that, they would have went to an online college. Um, but you know, my hope is that people are checking in and if not to start checking in with our students to be able to assist them. Another question that really falls along the lines is, of this is what has been done to support the mental health of students and staff during this time? Um, a person had marked it's been really hard to continue quote business as usual and try to be productive with everything going on. Um, and this person also expressed some dissatisfaction uh, not being satisfied with um, some of the communication in their division, not feeling like there's been many messaging or check-ins, and it feels like uh, people are expected to work harder than before to to make it work. And you know, I I know Summer has said it is business as usual in HR in terms of trying to make sure that the services are provided serve the students, but overall this is not business as usual for our institutions and for all of us. This is a completely different environment, something we've never experienced before. And as I've said before, we have to do the best we can. Our normal, new normal, however we wanna call it, it's different now and it's going to be different when we come up for air and when we're allowed to transition back on campus. Um, what I would ask for folks to do is, um, to check on one another, um, to check on our students. Our, our, as much as our students are struggling, our staff and faculty are struggling. Our staff and faculty are struggling with this uh, abrupt transition um, in the classroom, outside the classroom, and business as usual is not realistic. Um, in terms of working harder, um, expected to work harder before to make it work, you know, I would challenge and say that we do the best we can. And that might be 80%, and that might be 90%. We do the best we can to serve our communities and utilize the services that we have. So we have counseling that's provided wonderful services um, for our staff and faculty with benefits. We have um, opportunities for, for counseling. I think, again, to check in to one another and also to touch base with supervisors, touch base with vice presidents, with myself. Um, Talk about your, you know, your concerns, talk about struggles, providing recommendations on how to really connect with one another. Uh, we don't know everything and we are learning as we go. So we look, we, I look to get as much information as possible and there's some great solutions and ideas out there. Um, we just wanna make sure we create the space for that to happen. I'm gonna, jump to some of our questions that just came up back and forth. Uh, regarding the CARE Act, undocumented students might not be eligible for it. If they are not, how is Highline going to support undocumented students financially? Excellent question. One of the challenges we've had with the CARE Act is uh, we have received, and I know uh, Vice President Reeder has sent information out a week or two ago to the campus about the CARE Act. Um, but as we've delved more into um, the allowables, we have discovered, and there's been a lot of news about that, about uh, certain communities um, possibly not being eligible for the funding, which is a challenge considering that 
uh, for some of those communities, they are the most vulnerable of the vulnerable in terms of communities. Uh, what Executive Cabinet is doing is looking at ways to be able to still serve and be able to assist those students who might not be eligible for the CARE Act in different capacities, such as emergency funds, working with foundation. Um, that This is still in progress right now, and this is something that all the colleges are struggling with. We are hoping that if there's another stimulus package that comes out, that we would be, it would be a little bit more inclusive um, in the eyes of higher education, um, but we're not counting on um, another stimulus package coming. We just don't know. Um, so we're working with what we have, but we're also strategizing. We have some fundraising campaigns that we're doing to really provide additional resources uh, for all of our students, but in particular, our, our students that uh, might not be eligible for the CARES Act funding. And I think Josh is on. And if there's anything I missed, Josh, Joshua Gertzman, um, could you please speak to that? Or any additional information? Uh, yeah, hey, Dr. Mosby and everybody. Uh, I think you actually summed that up pretty well. I think the biggest thing is we're aware of the limitations that the CARES Act is giving us. And we've been uh, working at trying to identify outside resources. Uh, we've made some significant headway in the last two weeks for the COVID-19 student support fund through the foundation, uh, plus some of our existing emergency funds and a couple other donors and organizations are looking uh, to work with us to see now the money is not going to scale the same as the CARES funds are, but we, what we want to be able to do is to encourage any student who needs assistance to be, once the application is available to apply, and then we'll figure out on the back end which source we would helping we would be helping them from. Thank you, Josh. So we have a question from Izzy. Izzy is the, I believe, editor of our student newspaper. Um, hello, Izzy. Um, Izzy's question is, once students are allowed back on campus and things are at a new normal, do you think more online hybrid classes will be around than before? That's a great question. To be honest with you, I really don't know. I, I think that's a conversation that um, academic affairs, uh, Dr. Lardner, to have with our division chairs and our faculty um, to see, you know, what the reality is um, of the different course offerings. I know that the email that I sent out last week talked about the different options for summer and the different options for fall. Um, we really need to get data after this summer and really for the fall to see what's working, what's not working, and depending on what our fall looks like and what things look like in this COVID world now uh, will really depend on how our how we do our instructional service delivery moving to the moving in the future. Good question. Another question um, is about what do we tell students about graduation on the care calls and ask at Highline emails. So last week, there was a survey sent out to students asking about commencement and the different uh, options that's out there. And I believe today is the last day to submit um, their, their choices. And we've had, I believe, as of Friday, over, I think, almost 400 uh, responses. So I'll be looking at that today. Um, Executive Cabinet will review that information um, in the next couple of days, and I hope to send out an announcement to the entire campus uh, by end of week in terms of our plans moving forward for commencement. So we actually have, as of today, as of right now, we have 600 plus responses. Thank you, Heather. Um, so when we're making those, those care calls to our students and those care calls, just for folks who's not aware of that, it's a Highline Cares campaign and we have uh, staff and faculty have volunteered their time to call every student on our campus to check in on them, see how they're doing, um, see what we, how we can assist them, um, just really letting them know we care, letting them know we're here. Um, and be able to answer questions. There's been training uh, set up for that. So many thanks to the outreach team for really setting that up. 
Um, so we should have information regarding commencement uh, by the beginning of next week for sure. One other question that I'm going to defer to David and Tim about. Um, earlier, I heard David Minke indicate that plexiglass shields are being considered as a precautionary measure. Uh, are we considering installing plexiglass shields in all areas with service desk points, including the ITS help desk? So, yes, one thing the social distancing unit is looking at is multiple options. And so we did go ahead and purchase some plexiglass shields just to test it out and see how it would be worked. The main areas that we were looking for were customer service points where it's really hard to control the other party of where they're standing in relations to the person providing services. So we're looking at that as an option. We're looking at possibly putting some kind of barrier between where the customer stands or the person being assisted stands and our employee is working from just to tr try to create some kind of barriers. Um, not saying that we're going to provide plexiglass at every single customer service location, but it's different options that we're looking into. We may move some services into different buildings and set up a station for students to work out of to create. We're just trying to do anything that maximizes the six foot distancing and minimizes exposure between the customer service type areas. So I don't know if that answers your question totally because it's something that we're really looking into. We don't have all the answers yet, but I have a whole unit of staff working on it. And those are some of the options that we're exploring. Do you have anything to? Well, I'm just gonna say, and we have talked about this and, and Teresa knows we've talked about this in the department and specific to the help desk, it was designed to be open and welcoming and it's a huge desk area. So it's not something that, we're not gonna build a plexiglass wall around the whole thing, right? So figuring out how we can choose points that something like that might work in and, and protect one area and then take other measures to reduce the amount of people in the area or the amount of people that are close to the desk is, is something we're still working on. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one question was, do we have any options for some type of virtual graduation for students? That we're ready to graduate this quarter. And again, that'll that'll um, we will have um, information coming out about how we're going to be um, proceeding with um, celebrating our students in um, a in a either online, virtual, in person, postponed kind of format. So more information will be coming again towards the end of this week, beginning of next week. Well, benefit. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Regarding student employment, if funded with SNA funds, is the freeze still in effect, or does the freeze only cover those funded by general fund? What about those who qualify for work study? So I'm going to turn that over to Summer and Michael. I thank you, uh, Marta, for that question. That that is a detail we had not considered when discussing the hiring freeze. So I'll, I will, I've made note of your question here and we'll be sure to talk about that uh, also with Vice President Reader as well and get back to you. Uh, let's see, as some of us return to work, is there any PPE available for us to pick up like this. Very good question, Kip. Uh, David, we were just talking about this this morning. So masks is another discussion that we've been having and we've been looking at one thing. We really don't want departments to be purchasing their own masks. We'd rather have one mask that's available to everybody. So I know the bookstore was planning on selling masks anyways. And so what they had was a two pack cloth mask that's rewashable and meets what public health and CDC is recommending. So we're gonna make sure that there's enough order that anybody that requests one when they return to campus, they can uh, receive one. We're just trying to figure out a couple things of how we're gonna deliver it to people. So there's some, a little bit of work, but yes, we do have plans to have cloth masks available for employees. 
the biggest thing that you know we do want people to remember is that this is for asymptomatic symptoms and it's more for the protection of those around you and not necessarily for you yourself. Great. Thank you, David. Another question, uh, will Benefits Hub be talking in this webinar? If so, is there any updates about WISH? Uh, there will be information coming out uh, to the campus regarding WISH and where we are in the program and the process and information about students and how many students have been able to um, access uh, the opportunity and been granted vouchers. So information will be coming. I've, I've made a request earlier today actually to get an update um, to share with the campus. Uh, Laura had asked a question earlier and I talked a little bit about it, but um, it's a good one to state. Knowing that higher education was not designed for underserved communities, Highline being the most diverse college in Washington, we as a college should explore our processes for students to, to access and as staff and faculty to better support students. During COVID-19, now we have easy, easier, flexible processes to access such as forms to submit. Can we explore these processes that could be potentially implemented when we go back to in-person services, definitely. Um, and as I said earlier, um, really the request is for everyone to look at their processes and look at their uh, documents and look at the pathways for students to really be able to acquire those services and get what they need. Um, I think this, if anything, has shown us that there are things that we didn't think we could do that now we're able to do when faced with challenging situations. So. We should document that. I always talk about documentation and really look at, again, how to create a smooth pathway for our, our students, staff, and faculty to be able to assist and to be able to receive services. How are Zoom lobbies working out? I'm trying to remind students about services being open online. Are they making use of these? Might hours expand or a chat feature like the library uses be added? Vice President Reeder, are you able to speak on that at this time? Uh, yes. So uh, Zoom lobbies are, uh, they're working out, but there is a varying degrees of usage. Uh, a lot of students are um, preferring to call um, and still reach someone that way. Um, in areas like counseling, you know, the Zoom lobbies and telehealth is a little bit of, more of a challenge because um, that's essentially students inviting counselors into their household, which really can, can be um, a challenge for a lot of students. But there's just kind of varying degrees at this point. Um, the last time we checked, uh, we weren't having as many students use the Zoom lobbies as we anticipated. And so therefore we began to extend our, um, our hours to students. That way they could um, contact the departments that way. Decide. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> Talking to my daughter. No problem. No problem. Future Highline student. No problem. So, um, I appreciate that, Aaron, and, and um, I think and Stephanie. Thank you for for submitting that. I think we have an opportunity to look and see what ways we could do to um, increase access. Um, our students are you know, they, they do like to talk with someone. And as someone indicated in the uh, chat room, um, students tend to like to text. Would it be possible to implement a text feature in addition to Zoom lobbies? I don't know the capability for Zoom, to be honest with you, but I do find that interesting. I definitely think we can look into that. So John, if I could for a second. Of course. Um, so just so everybody's aware, under the auspices of uh, the guided pathways work, we are actually um, beginning, I, I want to say beginning implementation. We're trying to wrap up the, the contracts so we can start implementation of a tool called SignalVine, which is a texting tool uh, for use with students. Um, we're going to roll it out slowly and intentionally. It's not going to be... Um, available to everybody right off the bat. We're gonna pick a couple of, of high priority service areas. 
uh, but it is something that is a, a active project that we're working on going forward. Thank you. Zoom lobbies uh, were created when we were looking to how to best be able to communicate with as many students um, as possible, especially with the quick um, turnaround uh, directive coming from the governor's office. Um, in communication with some students, um, some students have been okay with it. Some students, I think, do, as, as Aaron had said earlier, prefer that that phone call face-to-face -face as uh, the uh, person said a few minutes ago, they do like that texting. Um, we are looking again to communicate, to try to get more information and, and communicate with students about their communication preferences. Um, I think if we could do it again, we probably would have interacted more with students from the beginning. Um, but, you know, for us, our goal was to be able to create a process where we can communicate with as many students as possible, especially given the turnaround time that was needed and the unfortunately challenging time, the challenge we got from the governor, which we definitely wanted to honor. Um, but that is a good point and definitely we want to take in consideration as we continue to identify uh, ways and better ways to communicate with students. So thank you. Let's see. How can faculty get involved in discussions related to modes of instruction that may not take that may take place in the fall? I'm grateful for Zoom meetings as a way to get things done, but I also think there's a lot to consider as we move to classes on Zoom for remote classes. And I'm going to ask uh, Emily, Dr. Lardner, to, to speak on that. But I would say that um, we have definitely wanted to get as much information from our faculty, our division chairs. Um, in terms of uh, decision making for summer, a decision making for fall, uh, we look forward to getting uh, feedback and to really have people a part of uh, the discussions to help make those decisions happen. Um, but I will defer to Emily because as Emily is running academic affairs as a vice president, interim vice president, um, can maybe provide some specific information. Emily, are you there? I'm trying. <laughs> Hi, yep, that's a great question. And as John said, the, um, the process that we came up with for the modalities for summer involved consulting with the union and consulting with division chairs and then conversation with coordinators to try to figure out what was possible. But we're still trying, we're still learning. Faculty are still learning about modalities at work. And um, we've, as John mentioned, we've said this is how we're going to offer classes in the fall. At the same time, in our instruction cabinet meeting right before the town hall, we were talking about strategies for assessing how this shift to remote teaching has gone, what's working, what isn't, what are we learning, how do we support faculty. So if you have ideas about modalities of instruction or other modalities of instruction or what other ways we can offer our learning to students in the conditions that we're in with COVID-19. I would love to hear about those ideas. Um, your division chairs would like to hear about those ideas. Your coordinators would want to hear about those ideas. Your union wants to hear those ideas because we really are in this together learning, trying to figure out what's possible, what works, what works for faculty, what works for students. And it's a huge learning project for everyone. So no um, desire to exclude people from, from chiming in and making suggestions. Um, we're, we just, in this instance for summer, we had to move faster than we thought was useful. So please um, reach out to me or to anybody else and um, let's hear your ideas. Thank you, Emily. So the next question, um, and I think this is something for all of executive cabinet. Um, the next question really ask about um, how essential employees are defined and the decision making in terms of who should be on campus and uh, what defines essential tasks. 
it's, it's a three part question, but I think that's the first part where we can we can talk about. So I'll, I'll just say generally speaking and uh, executive cabinet can definitely uh, chime in. Um, when we were given parameters and kind of definitions from the governor's office in terms of you know, who can be on campus in the beginning, it was basically no one. Um, then um, they provided a little bit of information to the governor's office about um, essential and the different definitions with that. Um, basically, I had asked the executive cabinet uh, to have conversations and to look in their areas in terms of those uh, particular people or services that need to they need to continue that's going to require uh, individuals having to be on campus. Um, those are very few folks um, because again, we don't want to have for the director of the governor a lot of traffic on campus because then it becomes a safety issue. Um, the executive cabinet provided that information uh, to uh, David and Francesca, who are running our, I, our ICS, um, and we have that in terms of a, of a spreadsheet. Um, again, we're not, we're limiting in terms of having a large number, but we understand that there is um, a collection of folks that, um, and, and positions that need to be on campus. If you have questions about particular uh, positions in your area or if that applies to you, I'd encourage you to talk to your vice president or executive director for clarification. Uh, can I chime in also? Yes, please. Um, so I also would add, you know, a few weeks back when we were getting ready to go into this emergency remote services, service delivery and teaching, um, we had to complete our continuity of operations plan, which was really that opportunity for deans, program chairs, directors, um, along with, um, you know, vice presidents and executive directors to be able to have a discussion, um, I, I would say, you know, at the departmental level of being able to work with your director to see what are some of the functions that, um, the department provides or the services that are provided to students um, and to the community that can be um, determined, you know, what that role looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, does that service or program or department um, already provide a service that's already easily um, able to be uh, translated to online services? And so a few weeks back, there was that opportunity um, that really happened level by level. Um, so, I, I mean, I can at least, you know, when I say this, I'm speaking obviously on behalf of student services, but I think across the board, we've had that opportunity uh, to work with uh, those folks that are providing leadership in our areas to really help us determine that. And then once um, we are able to get a sense of what services, what functions, um, you know, are at a certain level that we can then make the next decision on as a division, now looking at all of those um, departments and services, you know, which ones might be deemed critical. I think at an individual level, all of us would say every single service we provide, every classroom we teach, everything is essential to our students, obviously, but from a programming uh, level, we have to really make a decision on what, what programs, what services could we function with and which ones uh, might take a little bit more um, strategy behind them being able to to operate on a limited basis so um, that's a little little input i have thank you okay uh the second part of the question was um it's actually also a compliment but what do you think about having virtual campus community potlucks while we are working from home uh shannon waits and jerry ventura always did a great job of making sure we had one every month. How about weekly ones while we work from home? Would be nice if every department on campus hosted one at least once. I think would be a pressure free way for some staff and faculty to be able to communicate with one another in these stressful times. Um, Heather, let's go ahead and I think this is a good idea and something to explore. Heather, let's go ahead and capture that information and uh, provide that to our wellness unit for ICS and uh, they can look into that and see 
if we can create an opportunity to have um, uh, continue to have virtual campus community potlucks. I feel like we might have already had one as of in the past couple of weeks, so I'm not exactly sure you know why that stays in my mind, but that we can do something um, and add to the list of really being able to um, provide some opportunities for our staff and faculty on campus. And I think Jerry has done, I think Jerry is hosting one or has done one virtually. So, and Jerry's on that wellness unit, so it's perfect. Uh, let's see. Last, well, one of the other questions, can you please share additional details on cutbacks as they relate, relate to layoffs? When will these decisions be made and how will the cutback layoffs be rolled out? So right now, it, our, I think our biggest work right now is looking at the potential budget um, information we're getting from the state. And clearly there, um, there's different scenarios that are being presented in terms of our funding. Um, I know Michael in the faculty meeting last week did a great job of explaining that. And then we talked about that at a board meeting. Um, our upcoming um, town hall meeting in May, and that is on May, May 14th uh, in the afternoon. That will be a town hall focus on the budget. So that will be with, with Michael and myself where we will present information on the budget and take questions. Again, the majority of the time will be budgetary related. And at that time, we hopefully have more information and some more clarity um, our goal is to uh, be very um, intentional um, in our budgetary planning and what we're doing now, not just for, for the present, but also for the future. Um, our goal is to do the best we can to continue and move forward. Um, but it is, as, as Michael has said in his communication, um, it is a very challenging time. And as I said last week to folks, I know that for Highline, doing the deep dive in the budget is not usually kind of the practice, um, but it's something that we, we want to be very transparent in terms of letting the entire institution know of uh, the challenges before us. Uh, that being said, um, we are still having conversations. We are still looking at the different budget scenarios, looking at our budget now and for next year, um, and the different funding streams that are coming through the state that that now could be in question um, to figure out what that's going to look like for us for the future. So more information to come. I don't have specifics or a timeline at this time because a lot of this is information that's going to be coming from the state. Michael, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, so, uh, so essentially speaking, uh, there are things that we know right now and there are just a lot of unknowns that we don't know just yet. So uh, we are focusing on trying to complete the current fiscal year right now. And we know that we'll have some revenue shortfalls and we are uh, 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 and, uh, implementing uh, a few strategies to deal with those, including the hiring freeze that uh, was mentioned earlier. But uh, the biggest cutback is going to be trying to freeze all non-essential purchases. And, um, and we believe those strategies will help with the current year. But for next year, as Dr. Mosby had just stated, we are just still waiting for additional information from, um, from, from, from the state more, uh, even though right now we have been providing with some guidance of different scenarios, but nothing is concrete. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Aaron, I got a, there's a question that came in uh, that I think you'll be able to answer. Will financial aid be providing Zoom drop in appointments and scheduled appointments similar to advising so that students are able to get help with their questions? Yes, perfect question. So the answer to that is yes. Originally, uh, the hours were limited 9 to 12. Um, and I want to say that they were uh, Monday and Wednesday, but the director of financial aid and the staff really recognized that students needed more accessibility. And uh, um, so they created some extended uh, Zoom hours, which is also now Tuesdays and Thursdays from nine to three. And so typically they are, uh, generally they're using 
the Zoom hour, Zoom hours uh, no differently than if someone was, you know, sitting at the front end to lay front end. So they have been responsive and uh, really try to uh, provide extended services to our students. So students do have that, uh, that ability. And I would say if you know other students who may not be aware of that, um, on our Highline uh, webpage under virtual Zoom lobbies, um, that's an opportunity for students to see all of the Zoom lobby times for our emergency um, remote service delivery. Thank you, Aaron. So a couple last things. I know we are, it's three o'clock, so I want to be mindful of folks' time, um, but got a nice message. So I wanted to provide a shout out to the National Poetry Month student workers, Nate Yonke and Paul Lupe Sam. They are hosting a poetry reading to finish out the month with student winners reading their work. You can also read a favorite poem. 315 this Thursday, Zoom info coming. Um, been able to read all the poems uh, that have been coming through and they've been quite, um, quite powerful and it just shows really how amazing our students are. So um, it's a great opportunity each day or every couple of days to be able to celebrate our students in that capacity. Two quick things, I want to be mindful again of folks time. Um, throughout today, I've been talking about uh, faculty and our division chairs and our vice president. Um, but I have not, and I apologize, I did not say talk about our coordinators who are doing great work as well. I did not want to leave you out and I apologize for that. Um, it takes definitely a team of folks to make these things happen and really be able to serve our students. In addition to that, our instructional design folks, our team, um, have done such amazing work. So I wanted to make sure and, in, and include them. And lastly, um, I realized when I first got here, um, I kept saying executive cabinet when we, I kept hearing executive staff. And I wanted just to provide a little bit of clarification. Um, executive cabinet is the name, we have renamed executive staff to executive cabinet. It might not sound like a huge significant thing, but it is more reflective on the executive leadership of the college in the sense of that includes all of our vice presidents and our two executive directors. Our two executive directors, um, in recent years have been added in addition to our vice president. So, and our director of the office of the president, Daniel Sloda is in there as well. So it's much more, I feel, reflective of our institution and the leadership. And just wanted to make sure if you hear executive cabinet out of my mouth, and then somehow a minute or two later, executive staff, um, I apologize for any kind of confusion. And with that, um, there's gonna be also one thing that I did, another thing I forgot to mention, there's so much information. Uh, there'll be information coming out on campus about leading with love, building community on campus. And there's some beautiful work being done by a collection of folks um, at Highline College. And I think that really helps, strengthens our community and our relationship and tighten us together. So more information to come on that. I wanna take the time and just thank you all. Um, at the end of this, we have 220 people still uh, listening, participating. I hope you got in good information. Um, I hope you were able to um, learn some new things. Um, you are always welcome to contact my office to have questions um, that we did not answer or things that come up in the meantime. More information will be coming out next week that I'll be host hosting virtual office hours uh, weekly. Um, for people to be able to log on and to have some conversations. In addition to that, if people just want to have one-on-one -on -one conversations on the phone, we will be, we'll be able to do that as well. But the president's office will have uh, virtual office hours coming up very, very soon. And with that, I want to thank all of you for your time and out of your busy schedules. And again, among this uh, very challenging time, really, really thank you so much for just doing the best work you can and always remembering our students are at the center of all we do. Thank you very much. Take care.